Well, welcome to our first presentation of the day. Uh, today, you'll be hearing from Dr. Florian Voss. He is the International Rights Director and Editor of the New Testament Scholarly Editions, such as the Nestle Aland and the U UBS Greek New Testament for the German Bible Society. He studied uh, theology at the university, universities of Munster and Tübingen and earned a PhD from the University of Zurich with a thesis on the first letter to the Corinthians. And before joining the German Bible Society, he had, he had been working as an assistant to Professor Ulrich uh, B. Muller at uh, Saarland uh, University. And so we're just we're thrilled to have uh, Dr. Voss with us today. And uh, after our after uh, his presentation, uh, I will have a, a brief 10 minute time where I will show some of the uh, some of the German Bible Society titles that we have available in accordance and then we will go back to uh we'll go back to dr voss for any questions that you have we encourage you to write your questions uh down as you have them and then we will uh we'll compile them for the question and answer period at the uh, end of our time together so dr voss welcome to uh welcome to e academy and i'm going to turn things over to you thank you very much rick for this very kind introduction Though I'm not seeing the audience, I would like to greet all of you with a warm welcome from Heidelberg in Germany. It's my great pleasure today to tell you something about the Deutsche Bibelgesellschaft, German Bible Society, or in short, GBS, and particularly about the scholarly editions which we publish. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers of this E Academy, our highly appreciated partner accordance. We are connected by a long-standing partnership, and I would say friendship, based on a shared passion for providing biblical texts as accurately as possible, and based on mutual trust that has grown over many years. I should probably say in advance that I am not a scholar myself, at least no more, like the other highly respectable presenters of this e-academy. Admittedly, as Rick just said, I earned a PhD in New Testament many years ago, but I might not be able to answer questions that require a deep familiarity with the practice of textual criticism, especially in the case of the Old Testament, or a familiarity with the wealth of opportunities to assess and to analyze the resources by the software Accordance provides. But there are others present, as already said here, to answer this kind of questions. The focus of my presentation rather lies on history. Did everyone, did, how did everything develop that we see today? And on, on, on a basic introduction into the available editions of GBS. More precisely, my presentation consists of four parts. Firstly, I would like to give you a brief insight into the history of GBS. Then I will try to answer the question why just the German Bible Society publishes so much of the scholarly stuff and not, for example, the American Bible Society or the British and Foreign Bible Society with their honorable traditions. Thirdly, I want to give you an overview on the most important editions in print today. And finally, we will see what is in preparation right now, what comes next, because it seems research on the initial biblical texts and their history never comes to an end, unless someone comes up with the autographs one day, which seems unlikely. When in 1981 the German Bible Society was founded, this happened by merging different entities with each other. The oldest direct predecessor of GBS, the Privilegierte Württembergische Bibelanstalt, dates back to 1812. That's why we celebrated our 200th anniversary in 2012. I would like to show you a five minute video which we made on occasion of the Jubilee of the Lutheran Reformation in 2017 and which illustrates some major steps in our history. Just a moment, please. It should start now. The 
German Bible Society, Deutsche Bibelgesellschaft, was founded in 1981 by bringing different branches of Bible Society work together in a single organization. The core of the German Bible Society was the Württembergische Bibelanstalt in Stuttgart, which was founded in 1812 with the help of the British and Foreign Bible Society. But the story of Bible Society work in Germany is much older. In 1710, Baron Karl Hildebrand von Kanstein, an aristocrat, founded the Kanstein Bible Institute in the city of Halle. This can be regarded as the first modern Bible society. The Kanstein Bible Institute started printing on a commercial scale, producing the Luther Bible in print runs of 10,000 copies and more. By 1719, it had published 100,000 New Testaments in 28 editions and more than 40,000 full Bibles. The 19th century marked the real beginning of the modern Bible Society movement, with the British and Foreign Bible Society founded in 1804. One of the founding members of the BFBS, the German pastor Karl Steinkopf, became its first overseas secretary. The 19th century also saw the first critical editions of the Greek New Testament. Eberhard Nestle, a theologian from the city of Tübingen, developed the most famous edition, which was published by the Württembergische Bibelanstalt in 1898 as Novum Testamentum Grieche. In 1929, the first fascicle of the new Biblia Hebraica, based on the Leningrad manuscript, was published by Rudolf Kittel. The Bibelanstalt managed to print the complete Biblia Hebraica in 1938 against the opposition of the Nazis, since it was considered a Jewish book. The Second World War marked a change in Bible Society work in Germany and Europe. In summer 1944, the Bibelanstalt was bombed and the work after the war started within ruins, but with the great help of the American Bible Society. Many voices from Bible societies called for a fellowship. This request was met at the Conference of Representatives of 13 Bible Societies in Haywards Heath in May 1946 with the foundation of United Bible Societies. Among the delegates was Dr. Hans Lilja, later Bishop of Hanover, who represented the German Lutheran churches. The first president of the new fellowship, the Norwegian Bishop Eivind Bergrav, and its general secretary, Olivier Begois, encouraged the member societies to collaborate more closely, and this included the creation of a national entity by the many regional Bible societies in Germany, the Evangelische Bibelwerk. German pastor Dr. Ulrich Fick succeeded Olivier Begois as General Secretary of UBS in 1973, serving until 1988. In 1981, the new Bible House in the city of Stuttgart became home to the newly formed German Bible Society and United Bible Societies. A key area of work in the new German Bible Society was Aktion Weltbibelhilfe. A fundraising initiative started in 1965 to fund the international programs of UBS. Recently, the Welt Bibelhilfe formed the International Department of the German Bible Society and is responsible for programs and sustainable grant management. One milestone in the publishing activities in the following years was the German Good News Bible, Gute Nachricht Bibel. The New Testament was published in 1968 as the first dynamic equivalent Bible translation in the German language. It became a tremendous success and is the foundation for many subsequent translations. When the Soviet Union came to an end in 1990 and led to the reunification of Germany, UBS fostered many new Bible societies in Eastern Europe and supported Bible printing in Russia. GBS provided support for projects such as new Bible translations in Lithuania and Estonia. The new era also brought new challenges, computers and the internet. The new generation of digital natives demanded new Bible translations, short sentences, multimedia, cross-referencing. The Basis Bibel was the society's answer to this challenge. The German Bible Society is responsible on behalf of UBS for the scholarly editions of biblical texts like the Biblia Hebraica and the Greek New Testament. It therefore hosts the Mission Resource Center for Scholarly Editions and will focus on providing and developing these editions with the utmost care and highest accuracy. 2017 marks another milestone for the Bible. Germany and Europe look back on 500 years of translation and reformation in the spirit of Martin Luther. 
The new revised version of the Luther Bible will carry the Protestant churches and the Bible Society into the future. Together with our modern translations, Gute Nachricht Bibel and Basis Bibel, it will help to bring the good news of Jesus Christ into the hearts of contemporary readers. Okay, this was the video. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, and I'll continue my presentation now. Um, you have seen in the video that publishing is only one of our tasks, though probably the one we spend most resources for, at least in terms of staff allocation. We do not spend funds, which we raise with the Welt Bibelhilfe, we do not spend funds for publishing apart from very few exceptions so that our editions must be at least self-financing. This is something uh, that creates sometimes conflicts of objectives, um, because as a publisher, we have to earn money with the editions, but as a Bible society, we want to distribute them as broadly as possible. But this conflict is not today's topic. So, why on earth? Does the German Bible Society publishes so many scholarly editions of the Bible in its original languages? There are probably two reasons for this, a more general one and a rather concrete one. As this is no lecture in history, I might mention the more general reason just in passing. It's probably no exaggeration if one says that German biblical scholarship, alongside with the British, was path-breaking in the 18th, 19th, and early 20th centuries. I hope there are not too many French people listening when I say that. Probably it's sufficient to mention names like Julius Wellhausen, Wilhelm Gesenius, or David Friedrich Strauss. If it comes to textual criticism, one might think of Johann Jakob Griesbach, Konstantin von Tischendorf, or Hermann von Soden, all of whom you see here on the slide. The spirit of enlightenment and scientific engagement also with religion and its writings was widespread. Whatever one thinks of the so-called higher criticism today, it has stimulated the research of the transmission of the biblical text. It does not come as a surprise thus that some of the most influential editions of the Greek New Testament and later the Hebrew Old Testament, some, not all of course, were edited by German scholars. The concrete reason is related to a specific name, Eberhard Nestle, a theologian and orientalist, born in 1851. Late that century, Mr. Nestle, Mr. Nestle knocked at the door of the Bibelanstalt in Stuttgart and suggested a publication. He intended to compile a scholarly edition of the New Testament. In 1898, this edition was published. So you might say, an Arche and Eberhard Nestle. About the same time, the Old Testament scholar Rudolf Kittel from the German town Leipzig developed a plan for a critical edition of the Hebrew Bible. Kittel's Biblia Hebraica was then published in 1906 by a publisher in his hometown Leipzig. In 1921, the Bibelanstalt acquired the publishing rights to Kittel's Biblia Hebraica and asked Kittel to revise his edition. Yet another, much later revision became then known as Biblia Hebraica Stuttgartensia, which you're all probably familiar with. These two editions, the, Nest, the Novum Testamentum Grez of Nestle and Kittel's Biblia Hebraica, whose developments we will discuss in a minute, are the nucleus of everything which came later. They were then supplemented by an edition of the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the Septuagint, which came out 1935. It was published by Alfred Raas, who was the head of a major research project on the text of the Septuagint, the so-called Göttinger Septuaginta Unternehmen. In fact, the Bibelanstalt had first asked Eberhard Nestle to prepare a Septuagint edition, but after Nestle's death in 1913 and after World War I, the task was assigned to Raas. 
finally, in 1969, the Latin Vulgate, edited by Robert Weber, completed this quartet of scholarly texts. Hebrew, Old Testament, Greek Old Testament, Greek New Testament, and Latin Bible. But wait a minute. Didn't we forget one important edition? We did. I am thinking of the United Bible Society's Greek New Testament. We will hear more about it soon, but I would like to mention it already here as a symbol of our cooperation with the United Bible Societies. This cooperation is another key to understand today's role of GBS as publisher of scholarly editions. Originally, however, the UBS Greek New Testament had nothing to do with the Bibelanstalt, but goes back to an initiative of the American Bible Society in 1955. In the years between this initiative and the publication of the first edition in 1966, four more Bible societies joined the project, with the Bibelanstalt being one of them, but still with the ABS, the American Bible Society, in the driver's seat. Only since 1975, the Greek New Testament is published by the German Bible Society. At that time, we were entrusted by the United Bible Societies with a custodianship for the scholarly editions on behalf of the fellowship, which is the reason why you today find additional editions like Metzger's Textual Commentary and Newman's Greek English Dictionary in our publishing program. So much for history. Let us now have a look on what GBS provides scholars and translators with today. And due to time constraints, I will leave out the Vulgate and other editions and focus on the VHS on the one side and the two sister editions, the Nestle Allen and the UBS edition on the other side, with just a quick sideways glance on the Septuagint. All reliable translations of the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible must be based on the ancient manuscripts that have survived to present day. Fortunately, there are some excellent and carefully crafted, though not perfect, copies. The oldest direct witnesses for the texts of the Hebrew Bible, Bible are the manuscripts found after World War II in the Judean desert that had been hidden in caves near Qumran on the western edge of the Dead Sea. They date back to the period between 150 BC and 70 AD. However, apart from one single transcription of the book of Isaiah, preserved in its entirety, the biblical texts from Qumran are fragments. The oldest complete copy of the entire Hebrew Bible is the Codex Leningradensis from the year 1008 AD. Another ancient copy, the Aleppo Codex, dating from almost a hundred years earlier, is unfortunately no longer complete. The Codex Leningradensis and the Aleppo Codex are two prime examples of the so-called Masoretic texts. Text. What are scholars aiming for when they edit the original, initial, whatsoever text of the Hebrew Bible? On the, manus on the basis of manuscript evidence alone, the best attainable wording of the Hebrew Bible is as it was around 200 BC. Because of the incomplete nature of the text witnesses, this text form cannot, however, be reconstructed to the same extent in all cases. In order to present a uniform text in a printed edition of the Hebrew Bible, the construction of a critical text established by scholarly criteria, as in the case of the New Testament, must thus be dispensed with. It seems more appropriate to print a copy of the Masoretic text and then list in an apparatus the extent, the extent textual variations. The Biblia Hebraica follows this principle. As mentioned already, its first edition was edited by Rudolf Kittel and published in 1906 in Leipzig. As textual basis, Kittel chose the Hebrew so-called Textus Receptus, edited by Jacob ben Chaim. This was a version of the Masoretic text that Daniel Bomberg had published in Venice in 1524 and 25. Through the centuries since its first publication, it had become universally recognized as the definitive text of the Hebrew Bible. Kittel printed this Hebrew text with its vowel and stress marks, but without the surrounding 
Maserati commentaries and notes with the Masura Magna and Masura Parva. At the foot of the pages, he included a concise critical apparatus with textual variants from other known Masoretic manuscripts and from the ancient translations, primarily the Greek Septuagint. The third edition of the Biblia Hebraica, published in 1937 by the Bibelanstalt, was a milestone in it being based on the Codex Leningradensis that had been discovered meanwhile. From now on, this oldest manuscript of the Masoretic text, preserved in its entirety, served as the textual basis for the edition. The critical apparatus was divided into two portions, slide variants and less important items of information, and the real textual changes and other more significant matter. Above all, the margins of this third edition included the Masura Para from the Codex Enigradensis, although without further explanation. This publication laid the foundation for the high international esteem enjoyed by Biblia Hebraica. Over the course of time, and as a result of the inevitable wearing of the printing plates, the print quality of the Biblia Hebraica deteriorated and the need for a complete resetting became evident. A revision also proved necessary for reasons of content, especially in view of the increasing number of text fragments from Qumran that were now coming to light as they were published by scholars around the world. The task of revising the Biblia Hebraica of Kittel was undertaken by Karl Elliger and Wilhelm Udolf as responsible editors in cooperation with an international team of Old Testament experts. To distinguish the new edition from their predecessors, its title was given the supplement Stuttgartensia. In the most important aspects, the Biblia Hebraica Stuttgartensia, or BHS, followed its predecessor. As before, the Leningrad Codex served as textual basis. For the first time, however, the Codex was printed with a complete version of the Masora, critically edited by Gerard Weil. The notes of the Masora Parva appeared in the outer margin, while the edited lists of the Masora Magna were published in a separate volume with a numerical reference system in the BHS apparatus. The technical demands of this undertaking presented a major challenge to the Bibelanstalt. For the Hebrew text, a specially modified typesetting unit had to be acquired and adapted, a suitable typeface produced, and typesetters appropriately instructed. The first fascicle of the BHS appeared in 1969, and the work was completed in 1977. To this day, it has remained the only complete scholarly edition of the Codex Leningradensis with all important text variants and suggested corrections presented as footnotes. This is a good time for a glance on the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, which goes back to the third and second centuries before Christ. Its textual history is complicated, as can be seen from the comparison of Greek and Hebrew texts. The Septuagint is based on an independent and in part even older Hebrew text than that which later attained canonical validity in Judaism. It went through an eventful history up to the 4th century AD, when our most ancient complete manuscripts, the major Christian codices, were produced. From the time previous to the 4th century, we only possess fragments. And we have other translations of the Hebrew Bible, such as the ones by the Jewish scholars Aquila, Simarus, and Theodotion, dating back to the first two centuries AD, and the recension of the Septuagint by the Christian church father Origen, which he created for his famous Hexapla edition of the Hebrew Bible in the third century. The Septuagint edition with Alfred which Alfred Reitz edited for the Bibelanstalt is mainly based upon the three Greek codices, Vaticanus, Sinaiticus, and Alexandrinus of the 4th and 5th centuries, which you just saw on the previous slide. Thus, the edition provides a critical Greek text not being identical with any given manuscript, instead of rendering one specific manuscript diplomatically, as BHS does with the Leningradensis. 
variant readings of these three codices are fully noted in the apparatus, apart from minor scribal errors, as well as the most important deviations found in the three mentioned other early Jewish versions in the Hexapla and also in the Masoretic text. In 2006, we published a revised edition, Editio Altera, of the Septuagint. The revision was carried out by Robert Hanhardt, a Swiss theologian and Septuagint expert, who edited many volumes for the Göttinger Septuaginter Unternehmen. Apart from the correction of errors, Anna did some changes in the Greek text, as established by Ralphs, but focused mainly on modifications in the text-critical apparatus, for example, by including some more unseals and recensions, where Ralphs had only mentioned the three major codices. The textual history of the Greek New Testament and the situation regarding its witnesses, the manuscripts, differs considerably from the Hebrew Bible. In one regard, of course, the situation is identical. The autographs haven't been preserved. However, the time gap between the creation of the scriptures and the creation of the preserved manuscripts is much smaller, and the number of manuscripts is much higher. Today, some 5,700 of them are extant that contain the text of the New Testament or some part of it. From the earliest time, the second and third centuries, however, predominantly small fragments are preserved on papyrus, such as papyrus 52, which contains just a few verses from the Gospel of John, and was considered, at least for a long time, to be the oldest preserved New Testament manuscript from a time of around 150. These papyri were edited mostly only in the 20th century. The important Greek New Testament editions of the 19th century, among them those of Westcott Hort, Tischendorf, and von Soden, mainly made use of the major Greek full Bibles, the already mentioned Greek codices of the 4th and 5th centuries, like the Codex Vaticanus, shown on the slide with the beginning of, of John, and of the numerous later manuscripts. These manuscripts are complemented by biblical citations from ancient writers and by translations of the Greek Bible into other languages, especially Syrian, Latin, and Coptic, as indirect witnesses to the Greek text. Research on the textual history of the New Testament aims to reconstruct the initial text of the scriptures and to understand and trace the later history of the text. The result of this cumbersome scholarship is found in the current editions of the Greek New Testament, of which GBS publishes two particularly influential ones, the Nestle Arland and the Greek New Testament. As mentioned previously, the first edition of the Novum Testamentum Grätze, edited by Eberhard Nestle, was published in 1898 by the Bibelanstalt. It followed a simple but nevertheless ingenious principle. Nestle compared three significant editions of the Greek New Testament from the 19th century, among them Tischendorf and Westcott Hort. Wherever one of these versions differed from the other two, he adopted the reading given in the two identical versions and supplied a note in the apparatus showing the divergent reading. By this method, he summed up the best findings of New Testament textual research from the 19th century and prevented one-sided views from becoming established. Nestle's edition, due to its wide distribution, ultimately displaced, displaced the textus receptus, which had been the basis not only of scholarship, but also of virtually all translations since the time of Erasmus, including the King James Bible. The text of the first edition was reprinted several times in subsequent years. Under Erwin Nestle, son of Eberhard, this edition was further developed with the addition of its own apparatus criticus that cited not only other scholarly editions, but also the most important manuscripts. However, Erwin did not consult the manuscripts directly, but still continued to compile this information from other scholarly editions. As a kind of footnote, I would like to show this to you because I think it's, it's quite a treasure. I have found it 
in our archives, and it is a Greek German Novum Testamentum of 1904. It was owned by Erwin Neste, the, the son, who studied theology at that time, as you see on the title page. Stud Theol, Studiosus Theologiae, Erwin Nestle. The book obviously was a gift he had received from his father, Eberhard, as the dedication shows, which reads in rather biblical words, to synergo kai zystratiote pisto kai fronimo, to my faithful and wise co-worker and fellow soldier. The patristic scholar Kurt Arland co-editor since 1952 was the first to verify the information against the originals themselves. Together with his colleagues at the Institute for New Testament Textual Research, INTF, which he established in 1959, he also extended the apparatus to include readings from many additional manuscripts. This new approach reached its early culmination in 1963 with the 25th edition, thereafter known as Nestle Arland. Its Greek text, however, was still more or less identical with the one edited by Eberhard Nestle in 1898. But the great manuscripts discoveries of the 20th century, especially of the early papyri mentioned before, necessitated a fundamental reorientation of the text and a rewriting of the apparatus. And these were both introduced in the 26th edition of 1979. The latest edition, the 28th, came out in 2012. It faced two different tasks. On the one side, the apparatus was subjected to a thorough revision, which should make it easier to use. On the other, on the other hand, the text critical insights and decisions resulting from the work on the Editio Critica Major were integrated. The ECM is the major critical edition of the Greek New Testament edited at the INTF, and so far only single volumes have been published. When NA28 came out, only the Catholic letters were available, so that most changes, including alterations of the Greek text, occurred in these seven writings. You know already that the UBS Greek New Testament traces back to an initiative of the American Bio Society because people thought that the overly complicated Nestle edition did not meet the needs of commentators and translators optimally. In 1954, Eugene Nider, then Executive Secretary for Translations at the American Bible Society, proposed to the United Bible Societies the development of a new Greek New Testament edition. According to his judgment, quote, scholars in the United States were dissatisfied with the present Nestle text, unquote. He got approval from the ABS, quote again, to the preparation of an improved edition of the ancient Greek New Testament under the direction of an editorial committee of five to seven scholars with an advisory committee of additional scholars, unquote. With this approval, the UBS Greek New Testament was born, or rather conceived. Actually, the pregnancy took more than 10 years until 1966, when UBS 1 saw the light of day. Between conception and birth, there was intense communication between the ABS and the publisher of the Nestle, the Bibelanstalt, resulting, as I already said, in the Bibelanstalt coming on board on the endeavor alongside with some other Bible societies. The UBS edition offered in its apparatus only variant readings for passages that were particularly uncertain and or were highly important for the purposes of translation and exegesis. The new edition used the alphabetical letters A to D in order to grade each variant as to the editor's certainty of its authenticity. In addition to the text critical apparatus, the editors included a punctuation apparatus that laid out differences in punctuation or segmentation relevant to the sense of the text in various Greek editions and in significant modern translations. Initially, the Greek text, it's, 
the Greek text itself included a number of deviations from the text provided in the Nestle Arland up to the 25th edition, which was in print in that time. This changed with the third edition of the Greek New Testament in 1975. Meanwhile, one and the same committee was responsible for both the Novum Testamentum Grece and the UBS edition. And so it is no surprise that the text of the 26th edition of the Nestle Arland, published in 1979, was identical with the one of UBS 3. And the two most widely used scholarly editions of the Greek New Testament have thus since shared the same biblical text and differ merely in terms of their apparatuses, introductions, and appendices. Today, the fifth edition is in print. Like NA28, it brought lots of changes, especially in the Catholic letters. All in all, the history of the Nestle Arland and the UBS Greek New Testament is an evolutionary, evolutionary history of accumulating information, of increased reliability, and of growing coordination of both editions. Finally, let us have a look into the future, whereby the future of which I speak is at hand already, which is very New Testament-like. Because two of the editions which I want to present now are already published in part, the BHQ and the ECM. Since the BHS was first published, four decades have passed during which much happens in the field of Old Testament text research. Most important, the fragments of the Qumran manuscripts have now all been published and research into the Greek Septuagint has made considerable progress. The expectations placed on any edition of the Hebrew Bible have also slightly changed. Of greatest importance, any new edition must provide a clear, reliable representation of all extant textual variants, insofar as they are relevant to a biblical translation and exegesis. In this way, the edition will place the readers in a position to make own judgments of any given textual situation. The subjective views of the editor, on the other hand, are to recede into the background and be readily, readily distinguishable from the presentation of actual variants. The apparatus of the new Biblia Hebraica Quinta, BHQ, follows these principles. The BHQ is prepared by an interdenominational and international team. Head of the committee is the Swiss scholar Adrian Schenker. The BHQ continues in the tradition of Kittel's Biblia Hebraica and is designated after the first two editions of the Biblia Hebraica, followed by the third edition based on the Lenin Cardensis, published by the Bibelanstalt and then followed by the BHS, by the Addendum Quinta, as its fifth completely revised edition, BHQ. As before, the textual basis is the Codex Lingradensis, the salient char characteristics of which are now also rendered in print as precisely as possible, including the Masura Pava and, for the first time, the Masura Magna. The apparatus, devised according to the principles outlined above, contains much new information. And for the first time, the BHQ includes an accompanying commentary in which the editors elucidate their text critical judgments, provide a translation of the Masora Magna, and list and discuss the special characteristics of the Masora. The first volume appeared in 2004. Apart from the five Megalod writings, including the commentary, of course, it contained a general introduction to the principles of BHQ. Meanwhile, seven volumes are available, and the eighth one, providing Leviticus, is going to be published early 2021. If you ask me about the publication date of the complete edition, we have to distinguish, I'm afraid, between an official and an unofficial answer. The official answer is, as far as I know, 2023. The unofficial one is, well, 2023 at the earliest. 
I would also like to mention the major critical edition of the New Testament, the so-called Editio Critica Major, which is in the process of being published. It is edited by the INTF in Münster, and it documents the history of the text through the first millennium on the basis of Greek manuscripts, ancient translations, and significant citations of New Testament texts in ancient Christian literature. As the initial biblical text is being reconstructed with a newly developed method, it has become evident that the existing text, as provided in the Nestle Alan and the UBS edition, requires modification. Today, two volumes have been published, providing the Catholic letters and Acts. The insights gained in connection with the first volume, Catholic letters, were already implemented in NA28 and UBS5. The insights in connection with the latter volume, Acts, will influence NA29 and UBS6. Another volume of the ECM, is close to publication and will also be published in time for NA29 and UBS6. It will provide the Gospel of Mark. Nowadays, it is impossible to realize such a project as the work of a single person or even as the work of a single institution. For this reason, the INTF cooperates with other research institutes, among them the Institute for Textual Scholarship and Electronic Editing in Birmingham, which is responsible for the Gospel of John and the Pauline Letters. And what about a publication date of the complete edition in this case? Well, external funding of the project runs until 2030. So it wouldn't be bad to be done by then. In 2012, the United Bible Society has appointed a new editorial committee for future editions of the Nestle Arland and the UBS edition. The editors meet annually for working weeks and meanwhile NA29 and UBS6 are taking shape. Earlier on, I already I, I talked about the history of the Nestle Arland and the UBS edition as an evolutionary process. This will apply also to the next edition of the Nestle Arland, NA29. The structure and the main features of the edition will remain unchanged. Of course, we will see changes where the Greek text, we will see changes within the Greek text where ECM is available, and the apparatus in particular will be once more thoroughly revised and will be based on a carefully reviewed selection of manuscripts. Admittedly, this will be relevant primarily for commentators and expert users and for those who just want to be up to date regarding textual criticism. Well, one change will probably gain the attention of a larger readership. The editorial committee has decided to adapt the sequence of writings, New Testament writings, to that found in the overwhelming majority of oldest manuscripts. This means that Acts will be followed by the Catholic letters, and that the Pauline letters will follow only afterwards. I have no idea whether and how this might be implemented into Bible software like Accordance. This will also be applied to the UBS Greek New Testament, which will, however, also see other fundamental changes. The trend to aggregate more and more information in the edition will be reversed for two reasons. Firstly, it is today generally no goal in itself anymore to provide as much information as possible in an edition in light of the abundance of information which is available in the internet. This abundance not only allows but requires that editions, especially editions for Beginners, like the UBS Greek New Testament, focus on information most relevant for their target audiences and thus serve as gateways. They may, may then trigger interest to dig deeper into the matter of textual criticism by other means, like the tools which are available online or in Bible software like Accordance, or by editions with other scope like the ECM. Secondly, we have to acknowledge that today's students often spend less time with the old languages and with traditional philological exegesis than students 
used to do. Used to do. The editorial committee thus decided to dispense with information which, according to what we were told by translators and other users of the edition, is used only rarely. This pertains, for example, to the segmentation apparatus. Also, the references in the second apparatus will be dropped. Old Testament quotations, however, will still be marked. In the textual apparatus, the tendency to increase information in the history of the UBS edition has been especially obvious if you think of this sometimes long list of versions, church fathers, and lectionaries. These lists may seem impressive, but what is actually their value for the average reader? They might often just think, well, this is a long list, so the reading must be secure, which is not necessarily the case. UB6 will thus focus on the major versions and the most important church fathers and will also mention the lectionary evidence only if it differs from the Byzantine tradition. Instead of listing all the singular lectionaries as it is the case now. It also became clear that the editors should again go through all apparatus units in the edition and examine whether they are really relevant for translation and exegesis especially units providing individual readings of specific manuscripts, so-called Sonderlesarten. Just because these manuscripts are old and honorable, like the Vaticanus or the Codex Bizet, will be removed. There are others, however, which will be added because the committee considers them important for exegetes and translators. In the process of selecting these units, special attention is being paid to the Byzantine tradition because the Textus Receptus still plays an important role in the field of translation in many areas of the world. On this final slide, you can see how the beginning in, of First Corinthians, it's just an example, might look like in UBS 6. This is anything but final, and we will have a different font, certainly, and other things will change, but it shows the direction, I think less but hopefully more relevant information and focus on reader experience with this outlook i am coming to an end i hope that one or the other aspect of my presentation was interesting for you thank you for your attention so far Thank you, Dr. Voss. I think Rick uh, Mansfield is going to be coming on here shortly and showing uh, the uh, materials underneath the cords. But that was fascinating history. I, I, I was just honestly, I just every every word you said and watching the slides. Uh, I really love history and and that and what the German Bible Society has done and where it's come from. It gives me a whole new appreciation for. Uh, your work and and the work that with your colleagues what you're doing so rick uh, can you turn on your audio yes can you hear me yes okay and now uh, all right go ahead uh, just to let you know dr voss will answer questions uh, after rick does a short presentation on materials okay so basically all i'm going to do is just give you a brief look at some of the materials that we have uh, from the Deutsche Bibelgesellschaft, uh, if, um, or the German Bible Society. So this, um, uh, a lot of our users probably know some of these titles that we have and probably even had them, but uh, I figured we, we may have some, uh, some visitors here today too that are not yet accordance users that would want to see them. And so uh, let me go over here first to the right and you see our, uh, this is this is the accordance website and i have a page open this is one of the one of the nice things about our new website is that anytime you're you're on a page and you see an author for instance you can you can click there and you can get a page of all this and i i think i grabbed um all of these from um uh, i don't remember now I, I found it on one page and i um i i joined i put all these german bible society titles together uh, you could also search uh, for either one of these titles as well and find uh, and find this information. But um, 
the one that I'm going to concentrate on here just in, in the brief few minutes, I'm aiming for less than 10, is our Stuttgart scholar, scholarly add-on. Uh, and so uh, you see the what's included here. And then, of course, there's hyperlinks. So you can see the individual uh, titles because these can also be offered separately or purchased separately. But I will say that this is one of the best deals available in accordance. Uh, you know, any any um, student who is going into biblical studies, college or master's level or Ph.D., you know, could get uh, maybe one of our uh, introductory scholarly bundles uh, like like the, uh, the Greek specialty starter or the Hebrew specialty starter and then add this and really be set for most of the work that uh, that they would be doing. And so uh, let me show you uh, just a few things that are in here and kind of how, especially if you're new to Accordance, how we try to replicate uh, digitally what is available on the printed page. And so, for instance, here is the BHS, the Biblia Hebraica Stuttgartensia. And you'll notice up here at the top, it says that it's tagged. That just means that it's morphologically tagged. So when I hold when I hold my mouse over a, um, over a word, and I'm going to freeze my instant details down at the bottom here, you see that uh, that it gives you the morphological information uh, as you know, in that particular inflected form. And so with the with this particular uh, we, we accordance has more than one copy of the Hebrew Bible. But for the one that's from the German Bible Society, uh, this is the one that has the footnotes. And so you can you can see right there. I've, I've got my or you may or may not be able to see it's small. It's a small um, footnote mark, but there's the you see the letter A, the lowercase a at the top. And so that corresponds here. Here's the apparatus. Uh, and then, of course, if you if you didn't have the apparatus showing, you also can see the same thing uh, in the instant details down below. This is the exact same thing here uh, that's right here. So some people just to save space don't display the apparatus because they can see this in, in, in the instant details. And in fact, if you really want to save space, you can close off both the apparatus and the instant details and you can still uh, kind of tap and hold right here on this letter and you get just a, a you know, right here in a little window, it pops up. So we try to make this very flexible uh, for you. And of course, you can adjust the apparatus uh, with the text however you want. Uh, as it scrolls, the apparatus keeps up very quickly. If you, you know, uh, unlike the print edition, which, which uh, you know, kind of gives you a confined uh, structure, if you want to take the apparatus and put it up on the side here and adjust that, uh, you can you can do it like that as well. So. We give you lots of flexibility. All of these, um, you, you know, I can remember taking both Hebrew and Greek classes. And I remember the, app, the main the main uh, frustrating part about the apparatus was I didn't know what all of these things meant. One nice thing in accordance is that, you know, I can put my mouse over uh, a word and uh, or, I mean, over one of these abbreviations. And it tells me some of these are manuscript uh, and some of them are uh, Latin words. And it tells me what the what those mean uh, down below. Here's a you know, a symbol uh, and so forth. And so that's that's giving me all that information, um, you know, just down there in the instant details as I put my uh, mouse over it. All right. So that is the that is the the BHS, which is the standard, the standard complete edition of the Hebrew Bible, the Biblia Hebraica Stuttgartensia. We also have within this same Stuttgart scholarly uh, package, we have this uh, what's called the the Hebrew Masoretic Text with ETCBC, and I can't remember at, off the top of my head what that stands for. Uh, it used to be called uh, WIVU, and that was also an abbreviation, but it is a, a very specialized morphology and syntax. And so you see your syntax uh, tree that's over here, and of course, all of this will scroll together as well. Uh, but for uh, we, we offer now three different syntax uh, systems within Accordance, and uh, this this particular one, comes with that uh, Stuttgart uh, scholarly add-on. And of course, uh, as, as I put my uh, mouse over some of these uh, clause structures, it, it cross highlights over there onto the text. Uh, and of course, it also tells me down in the instant details what these abbreviations uh, mean. And so, uh, and, and of course, this also allows you when you're doing searches, uh, let me switch this here real quick, if I switch this to words and I go up here to search, uh, I can I can search for all of these different syntax um, commands that are within the ETCBC uh, syntax. And so uh, I can get very specialized uh, results uh, in that. 
All right, so then, uh, of course, the standard Nestle Elan, um, I mean, standard Greek New Testament is the Nestle Elan text, the 28th edition, which we have here. And what we did, we took that printed page and separated it into three separate modules, which you see right here. And of course, they all will scroll, uh, they'll scroll together, uh, which, is, which is really nice. But so I've got the main text right here. I've got the cross references here, and then I've got the apparatus down below. And so uh, the uh, you know when you when you see the uh, the the marking the sigla that's up here uh, you know those that sigla again shows up um, it shows up in the apparatus below or if I don't want to have the apparatus open I can just use my instant details and uh, that will that will appear down here or like I showed you with the Hebrew Bible I can press and hold uh, to get that information if I want to close. Uh, just about all of this off and, and just have the, the text in front of me. And of course, it's also morphologically tagged. So you see down here, uh, you know, masculine plural genitive, and it gives you a gloss uh, and so forth. So uh, this is all very, uh, very helpful uh, when you're when you're taking, uh, especially if you're studying in uh, maybe a, a language class or if you just want to do your own research. Not only do we have the Nestle Elan edition, but we also have the UBS edition. And, and you know, it's it's interesting because the, you know, the text is primarily the same. But one thing that we tried to do is um, is to reproduce the formatting distinctions. So, for instance, here in James 2.8, you see bold text here, uh, which is how the UBS text uh, displays uh, quotations from the Old Testament. But if I go back to the Nestle Elan text, what you see in James 2.8 uh, is the uh, is italics because that's the way that it's generally shown in the Nestle Elan text. So we, we try to stay true to that kind of formatting uh, as that's used. And notice even the paragraph breaks uh, are, are true. There's a paragraph before verse eight in the Nestle Elan, but there's not in the UBS text. So we, we honor those types of uh, those breaks and, uh, uh, you know, for, for each edition that you might uh, be using. Uh, all right. So then we have our Septuagint. And again, thinking about, well, how, how are you going to make this digital you know, on the printed page? So, for instance, in certain sections uh, or, or really in the entire book of Daniel is one example where you have two different Septuagint traditions. And so we have our primary um, uh, Septuagint text over here, and then on the right we have what we call our parallels. But this, for instance, is the Theodosian uh, text. We have separate. We've separated out the apparatus for both of these as well, and so uh, you can have this content uh, side by side uh, and compare that uh, as you as you would want to. Um, again, these these words are morphologically tagged, so you see the uh, you see the um, uh, you see the words. Uh, down there at the bottom, uh, let me freeze that. And so, you know, I have third person singular, aorist, passive, indicative. Uh, so, yeah, I, I have that there as well. And um, so, this is this is very this is very convenient. And of course, I, I should mention with any of these, if you you can add in a you can add in a translation as well. And so, you know, for the Septuagint, uh, we have a number of English uh, Septuagints. Uh, let's see here. If I go here to uh, uh, you know, we have Brentons, we have the Nets, we have uh, uh, we have the Septu the Saint Athanasius Academy Septuagint. I'll put in the Nets here side by side, and again, that'll all scroll together. Now, again, this Nets doesn't come with the Stuttgart package, but it is available as an add-on. So we we also have the um, we also have the Latin Vulgate, and in the same kind of uh, the same kind of setup as we have with the Septuagint. Uh, any place where there are um, parallel text, we have a separate module here so that these can be placed side by side. And uh, and you can compare these separate apparatus uh, windows as well uh, that are side by side. We'll scroll. And again, just like I showed you with the apparatus uh, in the in the BHS, all these abbreviations for these manuscripts, it tells you what these are down there in the instant details at the bottom of the screen just when I put my mouse over them. Uh, if, if I need to, uh, if any, any um, uh, uh, verse reference will show up at the bottom and I can change that if I want to, to, uh, uh, to, to Latin or Greek or, you know, for the Septuagint or the Hebrew, 
I, I can I can adjust that however I want to uh, to show up uh, that way. Uh, there is also a um, with the Latin text. There is a Latin dictionary, and so uh, if I if I triple click on a word, notice it took me here to to my Latin dictionary. And so uh, these are these are just short definitions. It's not really replacing a full uh, Latin lexicon, uh, but this is one of uh, two or three uh, Latin dictionaries we have available with the court. It's in this particular one comes with the um, uh, comes with the Stuttgart package. Uh, this uh, I was seeing if it gave us any more information about this particular dictionary, uh, and I, I don't really see a lot of information there. But I'm sure it's it's there in, in some of the, the reading materials that we have for this. So um, let me go to the next one. Uh, interestingly, with this uh, with this uh, scholarly add-on, if you want to get into the Gospel of Thomas uh, type studies, uh, you know from uh, and, you know from the uh, I believe Tom, Gospel of Thomas is from Nag Hammadi, uh, th then we've really got you covered because we have uh, we have the the Greek text. And uh, let's see, th this is not morphologically tagged. So the only thing it's showing in my instant details at the bottom is a transliteration of the Greek word. But we have the Greek text, we have it in English, we have it in German, we have, uh, we have uh, the Coptic uh, reproduced digitally as well. And, uh, and then we also have, um, we also have uh, these are fragments uh, this is more of a fragmentary construction uh, right here. And the the uh, the Coptic is interesting because one thing that you can do, although we have although we have spaces between the words, of course, it wasn't originally like this. And so you can go into the settings here and uh, if I go into advanced and I want to hide the spaces uh, for that module. Now it runs together just like uh, just like it did in the original. Manuscript. And if I were to pull this wide enough, uh, it will even it will even stay true to the to the columns, uh, you know, to, to the lines in the columns on some of the manuscripts. Uh, so uh, so that that really gives me an insight into into perhaps uh, how the the scrolls uh, themselves uh, look. All right. We also have a, a few other uh, uh, or one or two other items here. For instance, we have the um, this is the BHS Vorta book. And this um, this is a uh, in, this is a German uh, dictionary, very brief definitions, similar to that Latin dictionary that I showed you a moment ago. And, and of course, I, you know, one thing that I didn't show when I had my uh, Hebrew Bible open a minute ago, for instance, uh, you know, accordance allows it so that if you if, if you want to open up a lexicon uh, for the for this word, I can I can triple click and it will take me to this lexicon. In this case, it took me to the Brown Driver Briggs complete this. This particular lexicon does not come with that Stuttgart package, but is an add-on. But I, what I was wanting to say was, if you wanted to have, uh, it's very flexible. If you want to have the BHS Vorta book uh, as your um, uh, as your uh, lexicon to amplify to from the Hebrew Bible, you can use this as well, uh, or you can just use it as reference and look up. Uh, you know, you can look up uh, any words. You can also search. You can search for the for the Hebrew word. You can search for um, the gloss, uh, just you know, whatever you would like to do. Uh, we also have um, uh, Klein's uh, Vorta book, word book, uh, lexicon uh, for the Greek New Testament. Uh, same same principle here. You can make this your default if you want to. I think I probably have my my Greek uh, uh, by default. It goes to the uh, the BDAG uh, lexicon. Again, that's not something that's with the Stuttgart. Uh, uh, package, but it's something that can be added on. Uh, we also have the the UBS lexicon that comes with it comes with the Stuttgart package. Uh, I remember taking I remember taking uh, elementary Greek in the early uh, in the early 90s and use, using the third edition of the UBS Greek New Testament, uh, and it had it had this same um, it had this same lexicon uh, in the back, uh, and it proved very useful to me. When I was using that print edition, uh, and of course this is the this is the lexicon prepared by Barclay Newman, uh, which some of you may be familiar with, and so you can make this your default triple click uh, lexicon if you want to as well, or you can just use it for reference, uh, however however you like. Uh, the Stuttgart uh, also comes with the Metzger commentary, and so um, uh, you can. Um, 
uh, if you want to really get into the uh, uh, text critical aspects of this, you can do that. And we have the update to that as part of this as well. The oh, that's the wrong one. That's the comfort is not part of this. Let's see. Let's close this and add the let's add the correct one here. The one that we wanted, the one that we wanted was the one by Omenson. And so if I come here and I've got a I've got a folder called New Testament Textual Commentary. So here's the Omenson text guide. So this is kind of the update to Metzger. It kind of it builds off Metzger. You you, you really can still use Metzger and Omenson uh, together. And one thing, let me show you as well. Let me come back here to my Greek New Testament. Uh, I can even add these in as parallels. So for instance, I can add in the Omenson. I can add in. Uh, let's go down here and get my. Um, let's get Metzger as well. And let's let's give it a little bit more room here. We'll move the website over a bit. And so now, you know, I, I've got my apparatus. So it's telling me about the, the manuscript evidence and I can read about it in Metzger and Omenson. Maybe I want to place these. Maybe I want to place these different. You know, I can move these around however I want to. And again, it will all scroll together. Uh, so uh, just wherever I am, whatever verse is basically up at the top, uh, that will be reflected in all of these other uh, panes as well. And so I can I can I can go through any of these uh, these articles uh, that are here. All right, uh, let's see, what else did we have here? We've got our user's guide to the Nestle Elan 28. So this, if you really want to, as, as Dr. Voss mentioned, um, that the apparatus is more complicated in the, the Nestle uh, Elan text. Yeah, I, I talked about taking uh, uh, introductory Greek. You know, there was, there was a certain point after I was in the, like maybe the, the third class, third or fourth class that I took, we all felt like we had to move up from the UBS text to the Nestle along uh, text so that, so that we could have the, the better apparatus, although I'm not sure any of us understood it all that well at the time. But this is, if you really want to dig into that, uh, this is a great uh, reference and uh, it will, it will uh, uh, go through the, the distinctions of this and the, uh, the background and uh, the apparatus and so forth and how to use that. And then one other item that we have here, uh, which is not part of the Stuttgart, but I wanted to mention, I wanted to mention this. Uh, let me close that. Where did we go? Um, let's see. Um, well, I think I, well, uh, well, here, here's the, I wanted to mention this because uh, Dr. Boss uh, talked about the BHQ. This is not part of that Stuttgart package, but it is something that we have available from the German Bible Society. And so the, 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 what's called the BHQ is in process. And uh, this, this is something that uh, will be um, you know, eventually completed. Right now, there are um, seven fascicles uh, completed. So Genesis, Deuteronomy, Judges, 12 minor prover pro prophets, Proverbs, uh, Megaloth, including Ruth, uh, Canticles, or Song of Songs, Koleth or, or Ecclesiastes, Lamentations, and uh, Esther, uh, and then Ezra and Nehemiah. So these portions are completed. Uh, right now, we keep all of these separately. So it's not like the BHS, which you can search through the entire BHS. We keep these separately until uh, there are more of them uh, done one day. But notice what it says, you know, that in addition to the general BHQ introduction, each volume contains the following, the main text module, parallel apparatus, and Masora, both Magna and Parva and a commentary. And so you see that uh, here that I've gotten the text, I've got the main text, uh, here I've got the Parva, here I've had the, the Magna, and here I've got the commentary. And of course you can you can adjust these panes however you want to. You, you can you can you can adjust them in any way that you want to. And again, this like with the others, this will all scroll. Now one difference with the BHQ from like our BHS right now is currently the BHQ is not morphologically tagged. So you know, when I put the mouse over any of the Hebrew words in the instant details at the very bottom of the screen, all I get is a transliteration. But uh, theoretically, at some time in the future, we would probably want to add um, parsing uh, or morphological information to this content as well. So uh, so that's that's a brief overview. I, I should mention that we do have a few other items from the German Bible Society. Uh, for instance, we have uh, we have a number of German Bibles. Uh, uh, Dr. Boss mentioned the the, uh, the the revised Luther version that came out in 2017. We have that. We have uh, German editions with Strong's numbers. 
uh, that will cross highlight with uh, uh, with some of the Hebrew and Greek. And so all of that content uh, is available uh, as well. Uh, you know, about the only thing mentioned by Dr. Voss that we don't have are the uh, the uh, Editio Critica Maiora uh, editions. We don't have those yet in accordance, but I'm sure that's something that probably uh, we're looking into uh, adding at uh, some point 